Good evening and welcome to the Cape Elizabeth School Board regular business meeting Tuesday, September 13th, 2016. If you would please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item one, adjustments to the agenda. We would like to move item 6D to the beginning of the agenda in consideration of our business manager. Do we have any objections to moving item 6D to the beginning? So may I please have a motion for item 6D, please? I move that we vote to authorize $90,782 lease purchase agreement for one school bus. I second. Thank you. And discussion? Catherine, thanks. I just wanted to give you an overview of what the process was. We uh, sent out um, bid proposals to four different banks. We did have three respond. Um, the lowest interest rate was 2.08% and that is TD Equipment Finance, which is the one that I have put forward for you to um, approve if you are so willing. We uh, do have $31,544 budgeted to pay for this lease this year and with the interest rate of 2.08, it's going to be $30,885.73. So we do have a little savings there. Um, the other interest rates we got were 225 and 263. So, and they're all very reputable banks. Any questions? Questions for Catherine? John? A question for Catherine, just a point. We should probably check to make sure there's no comments from the public on this agenda item before we proceed with a vote. That, move that portion forward. Since we did. We can do that. Are there comments from the public on this agenda item? All right. Questions from the board? Seeing none. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All those in favor? Thank you. Moving on to item two, please. I move we approve the school board minutes for executive session Tuesday, August 30th and regular business Tuesday, August 30th as included in our packets. A second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. And item three, we have two new student representatives. We would love it if you would introduce yourselves for the public on camera. And we're excited to hear from you. Thank you. Um, I'm Kinnan McGrath, and I'm a senior this year. I'm Maggie Gleason, I'm also a senior. We're just gonna talk about the school year th thus far. Um, so this year we've had a few changes in the school. Um, the first of which being we installed a new door system, which hasn't actually, the system hasn't actually started but basically just the third door was installed um, and we're looking forward to seeing how that goes. Um, all the seniors getting key cards and underclassmen checking in with the front office to get into the school. And as far as classes go? Um, classes have been going well, pretty much business as usual. Uh, and another note about the doors, it seems like there's been a pretty positive reaction from the mm -hmm. students that at least we've talked to uh, about the new safety measures for the school. Mm -hmm. Yes. School's been going great so far. <laughs> uh, oh, and we had a change to the um, Upper Link program, which is a program that um, fosters connections between incoming freshmen and upperclassmen. So essentially, in the past, that's been a program where um, on the first day of school, freshmen meet with an upperclassman partner or um, group advisor, um, in a sense. And that's been changed 
to vamp up the program to help freshmen feel more welcome in the school. So they've been put into a smaller group. Usually it's, they're paired up with an upperclassman who they will meet with regularly. Um, in the past, they've just usually met once and exchanged one or two emails. Um, and this year, I think Maggie and I are both um, upper links. Um, we started out the first day of school. Um, we ran advisory sessions. Um, talked about we had icebreakers with the freshmen and it was has been a really good way this year to foster connections between freshmen and upperclassmen and help introduce the freshmen into the high school. And personally since I was a upper link last year as well uh, I see a noticeable change in the um, kind of fluidity of how freshmen have adjusted to the new um, high school. Uh, yeah I definitely get the sense that the freshmen are feeling as uh, alienated as they may have been in the past. Any questions? Great, thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item four, comments from the public on agenda items. Seeing none. Moving on to item five. Letter A is facilities and transportation. Greg, you have the floor. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. How is everybody tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Maggie. Good job. She ran track for me in middle school. I mean, you know, <laughs> just need to embarrass her a little bit. Uh, we try to give you guys an annual report of uh, the construction and the projects that we did around the schools this year. And as you can see, uh, in schools this year, we did th this summer alone was 33 different construction projects. Um, the the total of which for the school department investment is 2.5 million dollars worth of work. That's done in eight weeks. So it's a pretty substantial amount of work in a short period of time. These jobs go from having a high school having 35,000 square feet of new roofing to 18 windows being replaced, uh, a brand new robotics lab, which used to be our former ATM room, uh, which came out really, really nice and uh, should really be a, a great add to the program that, that's uh, held in there. Um, we replace things like new ovens for the kitchen at the high school. They may sound small, but for those food service programs, it's huge. And they, you know, keeping up with the equipment, and we try to do that every year. We buy new equipment for the food service so that we're not dealing with a piece of equipment that's 25 years old and we're trying to band-aid it and keep it running. <clears throat> we still have a few projects that are in progress. Uh, one of them is our unit ventilator program. We are now replacing every year unit ventilators in each classroom to try to get the heating systems uh, working better throughout the high school. So we target five of those every year. Uh, we started this two years ago, so we're up to 15 of these. There are about approximately 55 of them. So it's, it's a slow process, but we're getting there. Uh, as our student representatives mentioned, we do have a new secured vestibule system that's going into place. Uh, we're working out the final uh, plans on how it works and installation of that. So it's, it's, it's going well, uh, but it is going to be a change for, for the students. Uh, they're not, it's not going to allow just free access into the building unless, of course, you're a senior and then you get an ID court card that will let you get in and out of the building. Um, Pond Cove Middle School, we did another 18,000 square feet of uh, roofing. And, and these are pretty substantial roofing projects. Um, to give you an idea, the high school project, which was a two-year project, was over $900,000 for 35,000 square feet of roof. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's a big project, and it goes well. Um, we were able to replace this year all of the windows in both the middle school and Pond Cove libraries. Uh, if anybody's had a try at the windows that are existing there, uh, they don't open very well. So we have all new windows. You can actually lift them with one finger so we can actually get good quality air ventilation through the space. <clears throat> uh, one of the interesting ones you'll see on there is uh, middle school nurses epoxy flooring. So three years ago, 
um, we tried a new product in the middle school Pond Cove kitchen. We had a lot of problems on the existing floor in there, uh, keeping it clean, keeping it in one piece. So three years ago, we tested this epoxy program. It is awesome, <laughs> to put it bluntly. And we have now expanded it to a lot of the bathrooms in the middle school. Mm. So it, it, it wears like iron. It's, it's not permeable, so things don't soak into it. Well, this year we needed to do something with the floor in the nurse's office, so we targeted it with that epoxy floor. It came out beautiful, and it's, it's just a wonderful project, and we're going to keep trying to going that way to replace these floors throughout schools because they're just so much better, and they just wear so, so well. <clears throat> We are continuing on our renovation projects for restrooms. Uh, we target those. We're updating the stalls, painting, updating the plumbing fixtures uh, as necessary. And this has been all, all of these projects are part of our regular CIP planning. When we, you remember our 10 year plan? Well, we're working our 10 year plan and we keep updating it. So our 10 year plan keeps being 10 years. So it's, it's, it's a work in progress. So things are going really well with trying to keep that moving. Uh, we replaced all the locker, lockers in the third grade this year. So now all the first grade, the second grade, and the third grade are all brand new PVC lockers. Mm. They won't rust anymore, uh, which has been a big issue. We have the fourth grade uh, still to do, but we actually have the funding for the fourth grade uh, as part of our CIP. So that will be in place again this summer. Next summer, we'll have all new lockers in there. Um, we've also done the secure vestibule systems at both Pond Cove and the middle school. So all three schools are having a secured vestibule. And, and when we have them up and finally fully operational, what you'll see is, is that at Pond Cove and the middle school, you're not going to be able to just get into the building. You're going to get buzzed in the first door, but you can't go any further. You have to be either escorted from there with whoever you're meeting with or buzzed in to get to the office. So what it does is it creates this security area where if there is a situation in lockdown, that becomes secured. People can't go any further. All they can do is exit the building. So we've created those security measures to help um, meet the standards that are now being put out there for schools. And those are, will be up and running in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it, it was just a long drawn out project to try to get put together. So all told, it was, as I said, 33 projects that the schools did. If you actually look at them for the town and school and everything, we did over 50 odd projects. Uh, the 2.5 million um, is for both town and school. Um, approximately 2.2 of that is the schools. So as you see, we put a lot of money into our schools this last year, and we're continuing to keep that up. You guys have really been very supportive of my department in, in keeping with the CIP funding, and that has made a huge difference in our ability to really start to take and improve our facilities and make them for a long run without having to get into big bonded projects down the road. Um, and I, 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 in my position, truly appreciate that uh, and your support for that. So. Um, that's my report, and I want to thank you again uh, for, for supporting us. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Greg. It's, I, I was even, you know, of that 2.2 or 2.5 million, is that contracted services primarily, or, or is, this, is this also assuming cost to our own staff of time? It is cost to our own staff and contracted services. Um, we'll do a CIP job, um, and we make a determination every year which one of those are actually going to be manned by in-house staff and which projects are going to be manned by uh, contracted. So for instance, the 18 windows was actually a hybrid. We had a contractor set the windows. We did all of the sheetrock, all of the trim work in-house. It, it helps us balance uh, costs and things like that. My other question was, I, I remember hearing last year during budget time that there were going to be some more renovations to the high school library for, for the learning commons mm -hmm. concept. I wondered what happened, and then... Um, it, it's right in there. It says high school library renovations. What, what was that? <laughs> okay. What we did is we created two, um, I'll call them uh, private or uh, quiet study rooms um, where they can do all kinds of different things. Group work. Group work uh, that, are, that are built. Um, 
that are in place. We also modified the main counter so that it can be uh, entered from either side so it can create a better flow. There's also uh, purchased uh, furniture. Uh, the unfortunate part with the purchased furniture was supposed to be a 12-week delivery, then it went to a 14-week delivery, then it went to a 16-week delivery, and now they're talking 18 weeks, which is into October. Yeah. Um, we've got the Pond Cove renovation furniture, primarily all of that in place, but it's unfortunate, I, yeah. I, but 18 weeks is a long delivery. Yeah, I hear you. So well, that's what I was going to, I'm glad you brought up Pond Cove. That wasn't on your Pond Cove list, so tell us how that went. Um, that went really well. I thought I put it on my list. I'm sorry. Yep. The window. Oh, I put the window replacement. That was, that actually was kind of a change in the whole layout of the place. We've created a, a, um, an area for a, uh, the 3D printers to be housed. Uh, the computer lab is now open to the library and the 3D area so that there's a flow of traffic. The high bookshelves that you can't see over are all, been, they're gone, so now you can get a full visibility. It's really come into that Learnings Commons idea where you're gonna have some more open spaces, but some flexible spaces where the new shelving units are on wheels so that you can actually move them around to kind of create different uses or different ways to utilize the space. And that was completed also this summer. With, with a lot of your staff? Um, in that case, we ended up having to contract most of that particular project um, because we replaced all of the carpeting in, in the f area um, and it just with the workload, we couldn't do it in-house. Um, sure. For instance, the third grade lockers, we stripped all the old lockers, stripped all the hall, painted all the halls, built all the new bases, and we had a contractor set the new lockers. Mm -hmm. So. Um, like I said, I try to do a lot of hybrid stuff there just to utilize the, the best of both worlds. Um, uh, so. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate it. Yes. While no longer under the school board's purview, we would really, I know I would selfishly really love to hear about the renovations at the pool. <laughs> sure. Um, actually, the, the pool project is, is a pretty substantial overall project. Um, we are upgrading all of the dehumidification, the filtration, the pumping systems are all being replaced. Um, we are going with a UV uh, disinfection system. In other words, chlorine is not going to be the primary way of getting rid of bacteria in the pool. It is a UV system. Uh, it only uses a tenth of the chlorine that we would normally use, which is going to make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. On top of that, we're also doing um, updates and renovations internally. So all of the uh, bathroom petitions, uh, locker room petitions, are all, which were all stainless steel, which actually rusted, um, are all now plastic. They're all uh, a vinyl composite product with aluminum uh, trim pieces that do not have the rusting issue that we have with stainless steel. And I know most people say, well, stainless steel is not supposed to rust. It does rust. <laughs> You add enough chlorine to anything, it'll rust. Uh, so those are all being done. Uh, we have um, updated the lighting in the entire facility. We have a lot of LED lighting that's been added to the facility. We also have um, replaced the ceilings in both the locker rooms. And the ceiling that is in there, although it looks like a standard suspended ceiling, it's actually made out of PVC. So it's resistant to stains and everything. But if you walk in, you look up at the ceiling, you're gonna think it's a regular suspended ceiling. And it, it, it looks the same, but it is completely different. Um, we've gone as far as regrouting and redoing all the tiles in the entire locker rooms. So there's been a lot of those added pieces that we're doing. Um, actually, next week, you're gonna see some new graphics going on the doors with the new community services, I call it kind of the wave logo that they have that's actually being put on the front doors. Um, you're gonna see um, new signage uh, that, you know, uh, men's locker room, women's locker room, bathroom, and all that. So those are all gonna be, and several of those have the new wave kind of look to them. So those are all gonna be put in there. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be quite a, a different look. Um, it's a substantial project, and uh, I've got uh, you know a week and a half to really kind of finish it. So, <laughs> are we on schedule? We are on schedule, but it doesn't mean I haven't chewed off my nails so far and uh, been nervous about it because it it there's a lot of uh, 
um, so, a lot of deadlines that have to be met. So sort of along the questioning line of, of Barbara and just trying to get an idea of the workload that your department throughout the district has to go through, not just for the schools, but for the town. Is, is most of this work being done by contractor? And even if it's done by contractor, how much oversight does that require on your part? Um, well, first thing, as you know, we do town and schools. Mm -hmm. So as I try to explain to you, we have 37 buildings between the schools and the town. Um, you know, two, two fire stations, police stations, Obviously, Fort Williams has an absolute boatload of, of, uh, of buildings that we take care of. Um, we run all of our construction jobs in-house. Uh, we do not hire clerks the works or any of that. It's 100% managed in-house. Um, I, I usually run all of the larger construction jobs. Uh, Bob McVean, my maintenance supervisor, I usually assign, for instance, the locker project was, uh, for the third grade was assigned to him to handle from start to finish, and some of those projects are, are done in working with the contractors. Um, it, is a, it, it is a very busy department. It's a very busy. Um, it, for instance, last year we ran the library. There wasn't a clerk who works for the library. That was run out of, this, out of my department. So we are busy, um, but I think we're quite successful, and I have a great staff that supports us, uh, supports me to get it done. And, you know, we couldn't do, I mean, uh, last year, if you added up all the CIP projects between the town, the schools, our operational budgets, everything, it was $11 million. That's more than the town's budget. We have 42 people in the department. The town hires 48 full-time people. So you can see it's a busy, big department, but... I have a great support staff, and, and that's really what's made it possible. Uh, without them, I couldn't be successful. But I think we do really well at managing a lot of our projects, getting them done, and it saves a lot of money. For instance, the library job, which ultimately is a $5 million job with all of the you know, things for the, the, um, the trust that's been put into it and that kind of thing. You would have hired a clerk of the works, would have cost you over the two years, probably in the neighborhood of $250,000 by the time you're done, we didn't pay any of that. So that was all managed through the office, all change orders. Um, my office even writes all the construction contracts. Uh, we do all our own bidding, and in a lot of cases, we also do our own design work. So the new generator project at the high school was 100% designed in-house. Uh, the specs were put out, the planning board submission was done in-house, and presentation was done to the planning board in-house, approvals were done in-house, and the project was managed in-house. Um, so, you know, you start adding up some of those costs where you're not hiring your engineers and architects, it saves the community a lot of money, but it also allows us to do more things. Mm -hmm. So if I'm saving $20,000 on not hiring an architect to do a design for me on that generator project, that 20000 I can use for something else to get something else done within this community. Great. John, did you want to yep. add something real quick? Or? You wanted to know about the pool, too, didn't well, you? May I butt in, please? Yeah. Excuse me, but may I butt in? This isn't on the agenda. I mean, the agenda was a report on school construction projects over the summer. Okay. And, I mean, if we want to have an agenda item about the relationship between the town and the school and the pool, I that'd be great. But, I mean, personally, selfishly, I've got a three-hour drive tonight. And I'd really like to just stick with the agenda so I can, when the meeting's over, I can move on because I'm going to be driving until midnight tonight. And this isn't, I mean, this isn't the agenda. So please go ahead, but if we can just kind of keep it focused on the agenda, mm -hmm. I might. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Harry. Thank you. My questions were the same as Joanna's, was just an update, so I'm happy to move on. Great. I wanted to. Oh, okay. Did you have? I wanted to thank you and please share our thanks with your staff for this phenomenal work that you guys are able to do over the summer and throughout the school year. Thank you very much. It's really impressive. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. You too. Thanks. I don't have a three-hour drive, but I am going to drive my eight minutes to get home. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Greg. Have a great Next up, we have item 5B, the NEASC final report. Mr. Shedd has the floor. Thank you. Thank 
So first of all, um, thanks for all the uh, careful reading uh, that clearly the board members did of the NIES accreditation report. It's an important report. It's worthy of your time, um, but it speaks to your dedication that you're willing to take that time because it's a long report and there are parts of it that are a bit tedious. Um, so I appreciate the, the, the number of questions and the quality of the questions that were asked. I will say that I talked to the superintendent uh, this afternoon and there were 46 questions that the board sent to me um, and there is no possible way in a brief period of time before the board that I can answer all 46 questions. So what I'm going to do is to try to address as many as I can sort of thematically um, and I'm certainly happy to address in writing to respond in writing to any other specific ones that people uh, continue to have an interest in. I'd be, I'd be delighted to do that. I, I haven't I haven't had the time yet to do that. So the other thing that I would say before I begin is that my goal for this brief presentation is that at the end of about 20 minutes you have a sense of the big picture for the next few years, but more specifically and more concretely two very specific, concrete, large projects that we have before us this year. Um, and I'd be happy to report to the board at the end of this year and each year um, at some point you wish about the progress that we're making towards the work that is absolute priority work because there are, there's a lot of work that we have in front of us. Um, we've taken steps in the direction of a lot of it, but we have a lot of work to do this year. Um, so, so with that beginning, uh, I will say the first several pages of this are really, I went through all the questions and tried to, for myself, to try to categorize them. I know um, in the board, in the minutes, there's an attempt to categorize them by the NIAS categories, but in some ways, for me, it was more helpful to see, okay, in a little different way, what are the broad themes so I could sort of identify what the major, at least themes of questions were. So if you go through here, the major categories are school-wide rubrics, proficiency diplomas, and curriculum. Um, all those things are connected together. Um, 21st century learning expectations, um, which also maybe goes in the previous category more, and then authentic learning and personalized learning, which has more to do with instruction. Um, and then the teacher evaluation process, there were a couple of questions about that. Uh, school climate and culture, there were several questions about that. Uh, alternative pathways, um, both paths and other uh, pathways that kids could follow to get to get to accumulate um, uh, evidence of proficiency and and wonderfully engaging authentic opportunities to get to learn um, sort of general categories of uh, what are the what's the most important stuff uh, because there's a lot um, time priorities and what pe professional development would be necessary where are we going to find the time to do all the work that needs to be done um, systems of support for students was another common theme. Um, identify, identification of students who are at risk, identification of protocols for addressing and issues of communication around supporting students. Um, and evaluate, evaluating sort of systems that are in place, for example, the achievement period and, and other things uh, that were mentioned. Student and parent involvement in all of this stuff, um, in all of these tasks, in all of these questions. Um, there was one question about the budget. Um, sort of some questions about the process of change, who gets involved, uh, um, how to get buy-in from the staff, um, how to link the NIASC related work to proficiency diploma or proficiency based education work, how do we have those build off one another instead of um, sort of feeling like isolated things, which is a huge thing for me. Um, and then there's a whole series of miscellaneous questions. 
um, and you can, you can see what those are. I will say that m the presentation I do tonight will touch at least indirectly on probably most of the areas of these questions, but it really doesn't touch, it really doesn't address uh, the very specific miscellaneous questions, for example, about the industrial art space and, and those sorts of things. Again, I'm happy to um, address those in writing um, and, and provide more complete answers. So the next several pages, beginning page five, six, seven, eight, all the way to, all the way to 10, I think. Yes, from pages five to 10. Um, these are actually pages that you may remember seeing, but my guess is you don't remember seeing. Uh, it was very clear to me from reading the visiting team report that the visiting team, um, as close attention as they paid to many, to, to the substance of most of the questions that they had before them, I don't think they, they paid a lot of attention to this. It's a fairly new part of a NEASC self-study report, and it asks a faculty to step back and say, after all the details, after looking at all the different curriculum standards and that sort of stuff, what's the stuff that really stands out uh, to the staff that suggests to the staff what work is the most important to be done? And the major reason I included this is if you look at um, uh, page seven, these are the major needs. You know, within the self-study report, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of needs identified by the staff. Um, distilling those down, um, these are the major needs that the staff identified based on our self-study of what we did. And I, the reason I included this is so the board can see that the staff understands there wasn't a lot that was surprising in the NEASC report. There was a lot, but there wasn't there wasn't a lot that was surprising by the time we got the final report. So school-wide rubrics is a question the board has asked. 21st century learning expectations, finalizing the formalized curriculum, taking advantage of cross-disciplinary opportunities, which is not a strength of Cape Elizabeth High School right now, increased opportunity for students to have their passions and interests drive their educational program. All of those, and this is not a formally or officially prioritized list, but it's sort of an informally prioritized list of things that the staff thought were most frequently mentioned. Um, the advisory program and improving the climate and culture of the school. All of those, I think, echo the board's concerns as well. And I put that in there to let the board know that the concerns that you have are concerns that we ask ourselves and we recognize ourselves. Um, then pages 8, 9, and 10 uh, were also part of the self-study. Um, and you'll see we identified at least tentatively sort of a two-year plan and five-year plan for work connected to the critical needs that the staff identified. Um, so that's what the, and I'm not going to go over those, any of those specifically, but again, you'll see echoes uh, and, and some more specificity around some of, some of the priorities based on those critical needs that the staff identified. So what I'd like to do is just slow down a little bit um, and focus my time, the rest of my time on the pages 11, 12, 13, and 14. Um, and address the question of priorities, particularly question of priorities for this coming year, uh, but also pointing a direction for priorities for the next few years. Um, and there are two priorities, and they're laid out in a particular font, and the first one is on page 11. Um, it is to plan for and communicate plans for implementing practices leading to proficiency diplomas beginning with next year's ninth grade class. So. So the, our present eighth graders, as the board is aware, um, will graduate from Cape Elizabeth High School, um, having demonstrated that they have met the expectations um, that our proficiency-based education program will identify. So, so um, because they will be in the high school next year and they will begin to identify their level of achievement against those proficiencies next year, we have to have a plan in place. It doesn't need to be a full-blown plan that extends throughout four years, and there will definitely be, continue to be sort of elements of work in progress. But the general outlines, and certainly for ninth graders, what that will look like has to be in, in, in place. Um, and then on page 12, and I'll come back to this one, but I just wanted to break down the second major goal for this year um, is to continue 
the pilot of the new teacher evaluation system. And the two things are clearly tied together. Um, and so now I'm going to turn back to page 11 and, and talk just for a little bit in more, a little more specificity about what moving towards proficiency-based education um, means, what it looks like, and the tasks before the school. Um, and it's not a task exclusively to the high school, but it, the sort of the, a lot of the burden, at least initially, lies in the high school. Um, on Monday, uh, we, are, we have our first professional development Monday, and actually um, all the teachers in grades 8 through 12, so we're bringing up some middle school teachers. We're going to be sort of laying the groundwork and talking about proficiency-based education and some of the tasks that we have to do and begin to line that work up. And, um, give, make sure that everybody is starting with at least a basic understanding of the work before us. So, first of all, I will say that moving towards proficiency-based education um, helps us with NEASC, helps us move towards proficiency-based diplomas, so it fulfills both those requirements, and if we do it right, it improves the education for students in Cape Elizabeth. In other words, there's a real value for it in, in that work. Um, and in fact, as the board is aware, it's part of our, the strategic plan that the board um, passed a few years ago before the proficiency-based diploma law went into effect. So, and it's designed to assure as much as we can a level playing field and to assure as much as we can that kids who graduate from Cape Elizabeth um, are leaving college ready or ready for the next step in their, in their, in their futures, whatever, wherever that may bring them. And, it, and really the focus is, especially the way Maine is beginning to implement it, is to force schools to really spend their time and energies and invest their instructional time and energies in the most important stuff. Helping kids to become good thinkers, engaged learners, um, strong presenters, Still doing a lot of the traditional things because there is a certain level of content knowledge that's absolutely required. It's part of the educational system. But focusing more time and energy on the most important things and making sure that all kids are leaving with the most important skills intact. So the work that we have to do specifically to get there is curriculum writing. Um, I'm just going to run down these checklists. Um, the last two years, that has been the focus of our work, because you cannot, the, the first step in, uh, in, in, in proficiency-based education is to decide what the standards are that you're measuring. Um, to some extent, the, the state defines that for us, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, because they're at the very highest level, there are what, what are called the main guiding principles. Um, and every state will be, every school in the state will be developing a plan at the main guiding principles level, and you'll see what those are shortly. But then there are content standards that, that schools have to, hold, have to define and, and, and figure out assessments, how they're going to assess that, and that sort of thing. So curriculum writing, but all that starts with curriculum writing, where teachers identify the most important knowledge and skills that we want kids to leave. Um, that has been the bulk of our work for the last two years. Um, so the second thing is create rubrics tied to the 21st century learning expectations, which are the learning expectations in our mission statement. Although I will say that they are called 21st century learning expectations, um, but they would have been recognizable to Benjamin Franklin for the most part. Um, it is good writing, it is good reading, it is good thinking, um, it is applying all those things to life, um, it is being engaged in learning. Um, there are 21st century elements of it in terms of teamwork and, and, and those sorts of things. But I, 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 I sometimes get the sense that people expect that 21st century learning, that means that everything that everybody has ever done in, Amer in a school system is thrown out, um, and it's completely new stuff that we're teaching, completely new skills um, that we discovered in the 21st century that nobody knew about before, and that's just not, not the case. Um, so create rubrics tied to those. Uh, we have begun that process, in fact, at a department chair meeting yesterday, and we've started to review drafts of three of the rubrics for, sc for school-wide use, specifically around uh, research skills and, and writing and um, presentation. Um, we will be discussing those as a faculty and adopting those fairly quickly and then moving towards the other rubrics that we need to develop as well. Um, identify assessments. Our goal is to create my, my personal goal is to create 
zero, zero new assessments for Cape Elizabeth High School students to have to take. Um, and actually probably to pare down some of the assessments that we ask students to take and, and to focus our time and energy on the most important things. Because um, I think Maggie and Kinnan would agree with me, they experience a lot of assessments. Um, and, and sometimes they don't emphasize the most important things. Um, so to identify assessments that are tied. Then a huge piece of the work, which is gonna be critical in helping parents and students understand and make sense of proficiency-based education is the exemplars we develop. In other words, examples of good quality work and a range of different quality work. Because in some ways, and I've started to talk to teachers about that, in some ways, those example products are actually more important than the rubrics themselves because the example teaches. Um, and and it's, it's the models the kids can begin to understand when teachers look at the abstract words on the rubric. What does that really look like? Concretely, what does that really look like? So I've, told, I've asked teachers already to start collecting examples of um, high quality writing projects and iSearch projects and others, other things so that we can share those consistently with students. Um, we have to create a reporting system. That's somewhat going to be somewhat tedious and it's where teachers' emotions get really wrapped up in the reporting thing because that's how they keep their grade books. It's what the report cards look like. It's what the transcripts look like. It's the devil in the details that can, which is really important, but it can be roadblocks to, to, to moving forward on the big picture. So we gotta do that behind the scenes and get really smart about that and be able to communicate it with teachers easily. Um, gathering input from students and parents as we do all of this stuff. I don't think so much about the rubrics. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that, but I don't think students and parents are gonna get too jazzed up talking about rubrics. Um, looking at and talking about the examples of the kind of work that we expect from kids, I would expect students and parents would get pretty invested in that. Understanding the reporting systems and what that's gonna look like. Um, so we will begin to particularly elicit some opinions from juniors and seniors who are in their third and nearing the, the in their fourth years at Cape Elizabeth High School to get some perspectives from them on what this a system like this might look like. And we will move forward from there. And then there's a lot of education, there's a lot of communication to happen around uh, proficiency-based education. I will say that the state in the last couple of years has changed its, I'm not sure if they've actually changed the law so much. They've changed the way they are defining what they are expecting. They're giving more flexibility to schools um, in terms of defining at what level of specificity at what, uh, you are defining standards. Um, three years ago when we thought we were one year away from implementing a proficiency-based diploma, it looked like we had to report down to the nitty-gritty level of um, solving binomial equations in the fifth degree calculating the slope of everything and literally we were envisioning a report card that was gonna be a lot of pages long. Um, the state has eased up on that, that those requirements considerably. Um, and the reason I mention that is three years ago when we thought we were, I held two parent forums about, okay, what proficiency-based diplomas and report cards might look like. And I think it was not one of my better received um, public presentations. Um, because people were really scared about, um, about throwing everything that they've been used to out. Um, and and it, at one point it looked like that's, that was the direction we were going. But I've talked to the superintendent a few times and I think we agree on the, my mantra for this work going forward is it's gotta be simple, it's gotta be manageable, and it's gotta be educationally valuable. Um, and those are the challenges is to keep that focus on the big picture. Um, so that is sort of a huge area of priority. It is not a single-minded focus of work for this year, but it's as close to single-minded as I can get it because there's a lot of pieces to it. Um, but it's really important and it can be tremendously helpful to students. And as we get, when I get to the next couple, the last couple of pages, you will see that as we begin to think through moving towards the main guiding principles, which are 
the first, the top area, the top level of standards that we have to report to, it will cause us to have to look at students being in charge of their own learning because self-directed learners is one of the main guiding principles is that students graduate as self-directed learners. So that is, that is gonna cause us to look at what are the alternative pathways. I think we've already begun to experiment with that in some ways. Um, Cross-disciplinary work, all of those things are embedded within Maine's guiding principles. Um, so those will be exciting conversations that will sometimes be challenging, but I think they, they will address the board's concerns. And I'll be as interested as you are to know where we, what I report to you in May or whenever it is that I'm able to report or September, you know, whenever that is. Um, so pilot the new teacher evaluation system. Um, I've laid out sort of here what the, what the basic elements of that evaluation system are. Um, there were some questions about the tie-in between the proficiency-based education work, 21st century learning expectations work, and the teacher evaluation system. And without going into a lot of depth about that in this forum, the heart of those, of, of the work that we're doing, the, the different approach to evaluation are these rubrics that are published by Kim Marshall about what excellent teaching looks like in the 21st century. Um, those 21st century learning expectations and different methods of instruction are embedded throughout those rubrics. Um, and, and so they are really at the heart of the work um, that is also part of the previous page. Um, so I, I want to assure the board that that's the case. Um, I am working in the high school with all the, all the English math science teachers this year um, who, are, who will be setting SMART goals. Um, we'll be doing for all fall and spring meetings. Nate Carpenter and I will share this work. Um, more of it will land on me than him because his being able to spend more time with students and more of the day-to-day -day stuff allows, allows me to have a slightly different focus, but Nate will be very much involved in this work as well. Um, so then I want to go on. There are some projects that are continuing this year. Um, that I think are also responsive to questions from the board. Um, we are in the second year of our piloting of academy classes. So as the board knows, last year we had a freshman academy. This year we have two freshman academies, one for boys, one for girls. Uh, this year we also have started a junior academy, and that is to try to help kids understand themselves better, their strengths and weaknesses better, to find their voice, um, <coughs> to understand how they come across to others um, so they can, they can, they can know themselves better and become better learners. And I think it's, last year was a, a rousing success and I expect the same thing now, this year. Um, we brought three female teachers in to help with the, with the Girls Academy version of the freshmen. So we are spreading out the capacity to, to do, offer those kinds of classes, which I think can help us um, address some of the other issues and begin to think through how can we give all kids an experience with an academy kind of experience. Um, but we're, we're taking it um, in sort of steps. Uh, Student-driven learning. Um, are either of you in student-driven learning? Uh -huh. Kenan, you are, you both we are. Both. I, thought, I sort of thought you both were. Um, so we have tripled the number of students in the student-driven learning program. Um, what, what do you, what's the focus of your work, if I can ask I'm Kenan? Running like a Humans of New York, but Humans of Maine Facebook page. And a friend of mine and I are writing a screenplay. Screenplay, okay. So, and there's a whole variety of students from across the sort of academic spectrum who are involved in the student-driven learning program. Um, and we've, we've essentially quadrupled the number of staff who are involved in it and bringing in three regular education teachers so we can begin to get smarter about how to engage kids authentically. Um, there were a number of questions about authentic learning and I think that student-driven learning is it means different things to different people and there is no one definition for it. Um, but student-driven learning is certainly the, the pinnacle of, of authentic learning as, as we do it in the high school. There are more traditional projects that are also aspects of student-driven learning. For example, the iSearch project, the world history project in 10th grade, the 11th grade policy paper. It's getting kids involved in real work particularly when it involves engaging them and reaching out to the community. That's, as I think about authentic learning, that's, I think, what it is. Um, 
we are we have revised the advisory program somewhat this year. Um, it will have the, the the revisions will have the greatest impact on ninth and tenth grade. So we've actually incorporated some themes that I think are related to the topic of reducing stress. Um, one of them is asking for and accepting help. Um, in Cape Elizabeth, kids like in Cape Elizabeth, there is there are so many strengths of and so many joys of being involved in in Cape Elizabeth community, being a Cape Elizabeth parent and a Cape Elizabeth principal, uh, but one of the things that is true of a lot of Cape Elizabethans and the community as a whole is we don't, we're not really good at admitting what we're not very good at. Um, and our kids absorb that as part of their culture. They're really not very good at admitting what they're, at seeing and talking about what they're not very good at. Um, so that's kind of a theme for night, and, if, and the, the idea is they get better at understanding and being willing to see, recognize that everybody has areas that they're not very good at they can get more comfortable in, in asking for help. So we're gonna help them to learn how to ask for help and we're gonna help them to have practice asking for help and we're going to expect that they will be asking for help and I can go into details about that if you'd like. Um, study skills. Um, over the years we've had lots of questions about study skills and I will say it's not something we've had any systematic um, instruction in. And to be very honest with you, the reason is because I don't think we've understood study skills very well. Um, so there's this wonderful book that a lot of members of the staff have started to read. It's called Make, Making Things Stick. Making Things. I think it's called Make It Stick. That's what it's called. Uh, by several researchers um, who come out, as it turns out, with some fairly common sense uh, practices about making things stick. But it debunks a lot, of the, a lot of the practices that when I was in college I used to try to study. Um, says just reading and rereading and highlighting and re-highlighting and studying, reading your notebook and you know, there's some short-term payoff for that but it doesn't really make learning stick. Um, so from that book, um, which is in my mind authenticated by a lot of common sense when you think about it, even though we haven't, I haven't done it, and a lot of people haven't done it, we're gonna be sharing some of the insights from that book with kids and giving them opportunities to practice those things and asking teachers to embed some, some practice for those things, for those skills uh, in their instruction. Um, then 11th grade is around the general topic of building community and 12th grade is more concrete about uh, college applications and senior transition project, encouraging kids to get that work done early and well. So they're really excited about that. Um, maybe not, but I can, <laughs> uh, I can, I can answer any questions about that. Um, so when we will have time, when will we have time? I appreciated whoever asked this particular question. There are a number of questions that, that recognize from board members that this is a lot of work and it's gonna take a lot of time. So I've listed for you the time we have, but somebody asked, um, you know, is it going to take more time than we've traditionally provided? And I will say that it very well may. Um, whether it's summer professional development time or additional days um, built into the calendar, if that's possible, at least on a short-term basis. So I thought I would highlight that as uh, it's a lot of work. Um, but we've taken some important steps, and I'm confident we can get where we need to get. Um, so that we can begin next year with a four-year journey of, of actually implementing proficiency-based education. Um, so the next couple of pages are just giving you a little sense of the main guiding principles, because um, I know a lot of questions that I got had to do with how, do the, how does the move towards proficiency-based education tie in towards the NEASC work, which is really about 21st century learning expectations. So I've tried to map out for you here the guiding principles side by side are 21st century learning expectations so you can begin to see where there are natural connections and where there are not. Um, there are some areas where there are not, um, but there are, there are zero inconsistencies. Um, and then I've actually attached for you a copy of what means guiding principles are to help you to see that um, these are the big level at which we must report, begin to report how kids are, how kids are learning these things and demonstrating these, these habits, um, these skills. And I know that this does not report, does not answer all of your specific questions. My hope was that it gives you a general sense of, of answers to a lot of the questions, um, a sense of the highlighted, the two highlighted areas for this year um, to let you know that I'm happy to come back this year, annually, however often you'd like, and report. That would be good discipline for me. I've always enjoyed appearing before the board and getting, getting good questions and that sort of thing. 
Um, and that's, that's what I have for you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have now. I just have some, some brief comments. Thank, thank you for, for summarizing it and for um, laying out the work. Uh, I think it would be really helpful that as we go forward that we continue to follow a similar format so that we can all follow along what's happening. What you've laid out in your first one is nine different steps. That's a lot for any one person to manage. And we'd like to get some, I think in the future, some clarity around how those steps are sequenced because it doesn't look like this is not I'm going to do one in month one and two in month two and three in month three. There's a lot of overlapping things that are happening here. Sure. Having a sense of how those fit together on the calendar would be really important. And the other piece is this can't be something where you're in charge of each of these steps or sure. not going to work and having some clarity on who actually is helping you head these up and how they're going to progress along with that calendar, I think was really, really important so we understand exactly how the work is going to get done. Um, and then on, on the things that relate to uh, the similar on the teacher evaluation process, you talk about piloting that. I really want to understand what, what, what that means. As far as I understand, this is what we're implementing and here's where we're starting and just try to understand what's the scale of that. You've got three departments, so understanding what percent of staff is that, where are we, how, how, is, how are we measuring our progress in this implementation, and how are you measuring this start as a success if it's not a full implementation, what's the goal for the pilot, and where are we on the map. Um, so again, just taking the same steps that you've laid out yep. and adding some specificity and regularity as to how we're measuring it, same thing with what you mentioned in climate and culture. There's a lot of right. things that are there. What I ask when I look at those things, I say, what impact are we expecting these to have? How are we measuring that and how often? And having some view on that so we don't end up 9, 12, 10, 12 months down the road going, well, you did these things. We're not sure what happened. So that, th those are my comments on to what's been laid out here. So Please. continue to format Please. and add some specifics. you in on this. Um, Please remember, I believe it's October, that's going to be the focus of our board retreat. I mean, board workshop. workshop. So that, and we will do our best to um, address many of the points you just raised. I'm not sure we're going to get them all, but it, it, it'll be a pretty in-depth um, uh, explanation of what we're doing and how we're trying to roll this out, knowing full well that it's going to require some uh, amendments along the way. We, we, we don't. Principles ultimately are, are going to be um, evaluating and visiting teachers, um, all teachers every year. We're rolling this out a third at a time, and we are all of us are concerned about. Um, I, I'm speaking about being concerned. I hope that, that Kelly's okay. You think we should get her some water or something like that? Well, she, I thought I would bring her water, but I was going to get water from the bathroom where she I think she's okay. okay. Um, well, anyway, just getting back to this, um, w we really want to know what's re reasonable to, to uh, ask of principals and, and w will they be able to provide the um, meaningful feedback that teachers would be expecting. I mean, we, we won't really know that until we've given this um, a run or two, but we will talk about the concept and the way that we think it's, it will work initially in October. And before that meeting, a number of our teachers and administrators are going to be visiting the school district that's been working on this for several years so we can learn from, from them what they've noticed and it has been uh, what adjustments they've made along the way. So, what, what I would say is, is my, it's my sec, heading into my second school year here on the board, and I am uh, keenly attuned to sort of, as we set out the year in terms of saying this is what we're going to do, um, that right. we're add a, a level of clarity to that. And it's fine that there, those things get adjusted along the way, but the, the, what you're act we're actually trying to do needs specificity early on so that yeah. we're actually measuring it. And if it changes, that's fine, but it needs to be visible. Yeah. And so yeah. that's my, you know, great start. Let's finish it off and add the specificity that makes it real. And it, had, and it increases the likelihood that it'll occur. Do we have other 
Questions? <laughs> well, I would just say thank you for all of this, Jeff. This is really helpful. And, and as I read the report, I was taken by how um, sincerely your staff added their thoughts to strengths and needs. And I think that's a huge starting point, that it's not no one's sitting there saying, we're great, everything's fine. You know, they're being really pretty self-critical. So that's a huge starting point for you. Any other comments or questions? At this well, no, no, you're not allowed to go yet. I, I like to be last. Okay. Yes. No, I just, <laughs> I wanted to say that um, a lot of our questions, all of our questions, really focused on areas in need of improvement. So I would like to take a moment to just pause and say that there was a whole first section, which was around commendations. And so I think we need to celebrate that and communicate that back to the staff that we didn't just read what needs improvement. We also saw and recognize every day what is commendable. And so I would like to pause and say thank you and thank the staff and thank everybody um, and then yeah you know the, yes there is a lot of work and, and thank you for laying that out I think the board would like to kind of digest this some more and so we can all get together and uh, the next year looks like it's packed and we might be able to come together with some you know three to five year goals together out of this incredible you know document that is useful for the entire district that are you know meaningful and, and doable and that sort of thing so thank, thank you, you much, is the beginning okay. and the end appreciate it okay thank you and i thought i okay i found my agenda so moving on to item 5C, the superintendent's report. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, so just a couple of, of things I wanted to mention tonight. Um, one is that, um, I think that it's fair to say that we had a very good opening in our schools this year. Um, it, this, there was a, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of, of smiling faces. Uh, it just it, it felt very good, and I heard that from um, building uh, principals, or different teachers and staff. So that's that's lovely. I mean, you, you don't assume that, and, and I, I give everybody a lot of credit for just the the energy that is obvious this year. Um, certainly, as uh, was mentioned earlier by Greg, the the maintenance and and custodial staff worked very hard this year, in part working around the schedules that were constantly changing for all of the contractors that were coming in, doing a lot of work. Um, it, 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 they had to be very flexible and in many cases work long hours beyond their normal work week in order to get things ready for opening day. Um, also wanted just to thank Greg for his leadership and all that work that was done this summer. I wanted to thank the teachers um, for all that they did, much of it on their own time, coming in and thinking and preparing for the school year, um, making it work as well as it did. Uh, principals for all the hiring that they did and the organization that took place, the secretaries for welcoming and, and placing uh, students in new classrooms so the new community members felt welcome and, and that it was very personalized. Um, so all, again, a lot of people made this happen. Um, one to mention quickly open houses that are coming up um, even as, as, as soon as, um, as immediate as this week. So here's the schedule in kind of the order of open houses. We're starting with the high school, which is the 15th of this month. I believe it's this Thursday mm -hmm. um, at 6.20 in the evening. And I think everyone's to gather in the auditorium. And there'll be a discussion, a welcoming, uh, discussing the mini schedule. And I believe the format is that parents then would, would follow their children's schedule a bit to kind of get a, a sense of where their classes are, their teachers, and, and so that sounds very nice. So again, that's this Thursday evening at 620. Then next we have Pond Cove. They're doing it over a couple of nights. Um, their first night is the 26th 
Um, and at six o'clock to seven, that's for kindergartners. And then that same evening at 6.30 to 7.30 will be grades two and four. Then a couple nights later on the 28th at 6.30 in the evening, you have grades one and three. So those are the two nights for Pond Cove. Did I, I, did I give it to you okay? Yeah. And then the 29th of this month will be middle school. I'm sorry I don't know the exact time, but um, I'm guessing sometime around 6, 6.30. So those are all the dates, and um, it's always fun to go and just see what's going on. I know that a lot of you have children in the schools, but um, you can get into other schools. It's, I know people love seeing you, and I'll do my best to get to many of these as well, but those are the dates for open house. Um, wanted to mention a little bit about update on technology. You know that a lot of the computers were traded out this year. Um, well, what I understand is that the, the um, at, at Pond Cove, the, the ratio is, I think, two children per uh, iPad. And I'm, if I understand it correctly, those iPads are at the school right now. Um, there is still, the, the, we're still waiting to put computers and iPads in the hands of children at the middle school and high school. Teachers have their computers, really their computers that were held over from last year. That's why they have them. The, the um, grades five and six, they hope to be able to give iPads this week, but there's no guarantee on that. We thought they'd be in their hands when school started. We're still working through that. The high school, um, they hope again to have iPads here. In, uh, well, actually, iPads are here, but they've not been released. And we hope that those are also available to students by Friday. But again, um, Noel felt he just couldn't guarantee that. So, um, sorry to say that they aren't there. A lot of students are bringing computers from home, or they, in some cases, they have uh, cell phones. And as best they can, you all, maybe you could just tell us how's that working. Um, so. In most classes, either teachers are working without um, electronics, but I know in my government class, everyone, essentially everyone in the class has an iPhone or a laptop that they can use, and it's not really a problem thus far in the school year. It's the same that I've been doing classes. Okay, well, thanks for being accommodating. <laughs> we appreciate it. So we're, we're getting there, but um, they aren't in their hands yet. Seventh and eighth grade have their laptops. Okay, yes. I have a seventh grader, but so I can vouch for that. Five and six don't, apparently. <laughs> right. So um, we're getting closer by the day. Yep. So that's what I can tell you about technology. Um, we had a meeting last night where parents with children um, in, in special education it was held in the community building, um, or is it called community center? And a very nice meeting, well attended, a lot of great questions from parents. Uh, Jessica did a really good job of fielding the questions and answering them. I think the hope is to um, have a, a meeting once a month and for there to be some time for just general questions that would come up, but also to have a focus for each of the meetings where parents know in advance. There may be a presenter or a, a feature, and but those are, if people are curious about that, I, I believe that you'll find that. Will it be on the website, you think, John? Uh, How will parents know about that? So, um, I think it was in the all of the newsletters previously. School newsletters? Yeah, I think that they cooperated and, and got some of the other Okay, so parents can be looking for that. I'm not sure on that, but I think so. Okay. Well, it's possible there could be um, the Jessica that was on special education yeah. area for, for parents as well. But So that was a good meeting. Um, we had, as you know, a school board half day retreat today. I thought that was a um, very productive meeting. I, I must say, and I was discussing this today with, with, um, with Kathy. I just am really impressed by the school board. I mean, you're a, a, a really a pleasure to work with. I mean, I, I, you're, you're a diverse group of people. I love the diversity. Um, and you work well together and you're forward thinking. It's just, it's a treat working with you all. So I want you to know that, but I thought it was a good meeting today. And then I um, want to mention that next week, Monday the 19th, that will be an afternoon um, starting at different times, different schools, but for professional development work. And that's when Kathy and Jeff are going to be discussing, maybe it's primarily Kathy, 
with the eighth grade and high school teachers about um, proficiency-based education, but others, middle schools got a, a big agenda, upon Cove as, does as well, so that's gonna be a busy, a, a busy afternoon in all the schools. Um, that's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Moving on to item six, new business. Item 6A, may I have a motion, please? I move we approve the following job descriptions. <clears throat> teacher of, and the new job description titles would be um, Director of Teacher Teaching and Learning, Director of Special Services, and Special Services Department Office Manager. A second. Any discussion? Yeah, and Howard could get. The, the, the logic behind this is that we feel that um, the changes that are recommended are, are match reality much more than, and, and are more clear than the current job descriptions. The director of instruction, as Kathy knows better than, than I do, is a, a much larger job than instruction, and, 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 and that this is, I think, underscoring the importance of our primary work, which is teaching and learning. As Mr. Sheila mentioned earlier tonight, it is about teaching and learning, and her job is very complicated, and we think this is more complete, and, 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 and uh, getting back to transparency, it's trans transparent. That's what the job is all about. Special education is also limits what that job is. It's misleading. The, um, the director, what, what we're recommending of special services, also has a very large number of students that she has to be, be thinking of with teachers and administrators on, for example, 504s. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's the, the thinking behind these two changes. And if you, recommend, if you were to agree with the director of special services title, then logically the title for the office manager should match. So that's what's behind all this. Mm -hmm. I just have one tiny question, Howard, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. Under the d job description for Director of Teaching and Learning under Administration Organizational Management, which is on the second page, I just had noticed this. One of the bullets is to serve as the Certification Committee Chair. If it, is Kathy going to be evaluating teachers? Because my understanding was you had to keep certification evaluation quite separate, so I wasn't sure if it was appropriately chaired by someone who also does evaluations? Well, first of all, I don't think that Kathy will be doing any of teacher evaluation. Oh, okay, I thought I saw uh, that. No. Okay. Um, I think that the principal, hopefully, if he or she has concerns about a teacher, it would like her to come in and, and, and give him or her their read um, or some suggestions on how to help a teacher grow. I think Kathy has said that she would be all in on that. Mm -hmm. but, but she won't be doing any evaluation. Okay. But you raised a good point beyond that, Barbara. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that what all else that is, is um, facing Kathy in her job, that, she, that that's the best use of her time mm -hmm. to be directing mm -hmm. the certification committee. Mm -hmm. to, maybe to sit on the committee right. might make some sense. Um, but I really hope in time that we could, could maybe think of a strong lead teacher exactly. maybe taking that job yeah. on. With a stipend. Or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Does that make sense to you, Kathy, too? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Further discussion? All those in favor? Item 6B, may I have a motion, please? I move that we approve the following 2016-17 administrative and co-curricular personnel nominations as listed under 6B for the middle school and um, high school. Second. Discussion? I'd I, like, oh. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I think that we were probably going to say the same thing, which is I'm really appreciative of yeah. those who step up in the district. The day yeah, is long too. to start yep. with. Uh -huh. What I was going to say. Thank you. 
All those in favor? Thank you. Item 6C. May I have a motion, please? I uh, move that we approve an unpaid leave of absence during the 16-17 school year for high school staff member Sarah Harrington. A second. Discussion or questions? All those in favor? Thank you. It's for a short time. We've already disposed with item 60, so moving on to item 7, committee reports. Okay. Um, policy committee met yesterday, thus we have nothing new for the agenda today because we literally just met. But for our um, next meeting, we will be meeting again on October, let me find that, 4th at 6.30. It's a free Tuesday night. We're moving our meetings. Hopefully you've had a chance, Jeff and Kelly, to hear this for four meetings where it's appropriate for you to join us. We're looking at Tuesday evenings now instead of possibly taking you out of the schools on Monday mornings. Um, we, we have decided to um, devote most of that meeting to a procedural a policy to go along with the gift policy we adopted in May in order to uh, listen to recommendations by our superintendent and talk about the way that we accept gifts from a variety of funding organizations, including our wonderful benefactors at SEAF, but also PTOs and boosters and so forth. So our focus right now is making sure our gift policy is, is broad enough uh, and clear enough with procedures behind it that make sense to all involved. So we'll be bringing that to you at the October meeting for first read. Thank you. John? No, perhaps the spring school committee. So we, we've met uh, a couple times and uh, most recently we're sort of on a, we're evaluating a couple of proposals, one from the school department, one from the historical society. We're on uh, sort of a bit of a pause now as to determine, uh, we'll get an initial read on the status of the building. Um, there's some indication that in the original deed, it was the building and land were granted uh, for the specific use as a library. Um, and there's some research to do to understand, uh, is that the most current deed? Uh, and what is the status of that in terms of, from some expertise in terms of gifts to, to Public entities and how that how that title may or may not be cleared and uh, any risks in, uh, there may be in proceeding forward. So, with, depending the outcome of that, we will then continue to deliberate as to what the uh, appropriate uh, reuse of that building is. We're meeting tomorrow night. I think it's six thirty. Is that right? Six thirty. I thought it was six. I think it's six thirty. So that's the 14th, 6 or 6.30. I have it as 6. 6, okay. Anyone's welcome to come. <laughs> Any other community reports? It's early in the school year, folks. <laughs> um, number nine, oh, what, number eight, school board agenda requests. I have a thought that's not a, really an agenda request, but I was hoping perhaps at some time this fall and certainly before we get into budget, I'd really like an opportunity, maybe before a meeting, um, to tour and see some of the highlights of the capital improvement pieces that have been put in place this year, uh, some of the window replacement stuff, as because we, we've looked before when there were problems. I'd love to see the resolution. I'd love to see the learning commons in the elementary school, the added conference room. I mean, we'll see it in the high school when we meet there. But having a walkthrough for us at some point this fall prior to budget consideration could be really helpful. Yes, oh, oh, please, please. So if you would just, if you uh, all agree with that recommendation, if you just give me the date which the board meeting uh, would be the right time, and we'll have someone be sure to meet you at, we could you know, meet at, say, at high school, do the high school, and then move over and tour those, and then walk mm -hmm. there over here. That'd be great. Maybe, yeah, you know, yeah. Meet an hour early. Yeah, thank so you. So if you just let us know which night you want to do it, we'll um, gladly arrange that. Great, thank you. Maybe on a workshop night, since we'll... We and then we could meet. start on this end, and then in the high school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go September, or October workshop, or night, or event? What would be the... When do you want to do this? Mm, well, I 
propose September while the weather's nice. Well, weather's nope. nice. She said no. Yes. no, no okay. No, no, no. <laughs> so you're sticking your head to the So if we met at 530 in th at the elementary middle school complex and saw some of those upgrades and then just walked down to the high school, we could see that and then have our meeting. Meet at 530? At the elementary entrance, the door. Okay. To the well, and then we're at the elementary middle and then go to the high school? Go to the high school since that's where because our Because our meeting is, our, our yeah, workshops, meeting is quite known that. our workshops are all at the middle school. I mean the high school. There you go. So a nice place to end. Yeah. Good. Great. Okay. Thank you. 5.30 starting at Honco. Honco, right? and that would be on the 27th. On our workshop night. 9.27? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a really nice suggestion. Thank you for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to reiterate for the public that um, agenda requests can also come through email to myself and or the superintendent. And um, those email addresses are available on the uh, newly revised district website. Everybody check it out and, and find out all the stuff that you can now find there. Um, any other requests? Moving on to announcements of upcoming meetings. I thank you, Barbara and John, for both incorporating. You did that. <laughs> You've preemptorily done that. Um, and item 10, everybody's favorite. I move that we adjourn. <laughs> Second. All those in favor? Barbara.